And please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's Holy Word to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, We continue in our gospel worship series. Ordinarily, we would uh, have a sermon on the Christian family, but as we have considered that this morning, thought it would be wise to follow up from last week's sermon on gospel worship on hearing. Uh, As we approach the the house of God, we are to hear, um, lest we give the sacrifice of fools. So it seems wise to speak on the doctrine of preaching as an element of God's holy worship. And so we pick up our reading in verse 14. Most of the preaching will be uh, from verses 17 on, but it is good to begin with our context here in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14. Trusting you are there, let us now hear the word of our God as he speaks to us. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. O Lord, send a blessing on the preached word. Give your minister the words to speak, Uh, Not those foolish words that man's wisdom speaks, but instead the foolishness that man sees as foolishness, but is really the wisdom of God, the preaching of Christ and him crucified. O Lord, we pray for the ears that would hear that the spirit of Christ would come upon them in power, that this word would not be a word that would leave us unaffected, that it would press into our conscience and that we would better understand how we might be worshipers of God. And for those here who are unconverted, may this be the day that the gospel meets them in power, that they become worshipers of the living God, so that we might understand that preaching truly is the power of God unto salvation. And we pray now that you would bless this time. We ask that uh, as you have promised, your word would be like fire, And as a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces, break and smash the stony hearts that we have. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you're probably aware, the popular sentiment in our society can be summed up in these words. Don't preach at me. Don't preach at me. Right? Our age despises authority, especially moral authority. And so this sentiment of don't preach at me has even infiltrated the churches of God. You see this seeker-sensitive movement that has been around for decades now. And the idea is that we do not confront 
those who attend the worship of God with the authority and power and majesty of God. But instead, we tickle their ears, we entertain them, we amuse them in the hopes that somehow that would lead them to Christ. And yet the very thing that is preached in these pulpits is not Christ and Him crucified. And so, of course, these who come to have a good time in the worship of God, which is not what the worship of God is for, of course, uh, they will never find themselves reconciled to God and they will never find themselves true worshipers of God. Today, it is sad to say that the proper preaching of the word of God is considered antiquated, right? Uh, Even in churches that may hold an orthodox uh, creed, uh, would they have replaced often preaching with conversations, with fireside chats, and the small group conversations. Uh, even in uh, Reformed churches, the second service is often gone. There's no preaching. Uh, there might be psalm singing and there might be prayers offered, but the one element, the most necessary element that is necessary there is not found, which is the preaching of the Word. And part of the reason for that is that we have lost in our circles a sense that the attendance to the preaching of the word is our worship to God. That when we attend to preaching, we are actually worshiping God. You know, the singing, I was talking to a couple of brothers after last week's service, which is one of the reasons that this uh, theme was provoked, is that they often have said it has been in their own history where they have seen where the singing is seen as the worship But the preaching and the reverent hearing of it has never been counted as worship in their circles. And yet the truth of the matter is that the preaching, the proper preaching of the word of God is the highest of the elements of worship. You might even ask, why is it in a 90 minute worship service that 50 to 60 minutes in our service is taken with the reading and preaching of God's word? It's because this is the primary element of worship. And even as psalm singers, right, we can kind of go askew. We can say, okay, well, we sing the psalms because this is our our worship to God. And it's true, but it's not the only portion. And it's actually, and this is why we excuse poor preaching in psalm singing churches, it's actually not even the primary element of worship. The primary element of worship is the proper preaching of the word of God and the reverent hearing of it. And with the neglect of a high view of the preaching of the word has come great weakness in the Christian church, right? You think of this, because of that, because the preaching of the word is not handled right by the minister, and it's also not received in the manner it ought to be received, right? We find that men and women are glorying in themselves and not in the Lord only. We do not see Christ as our all in all. Men and women are not driven out of themselves and driven and pressed towards Christ. Why? Because the proper preaching of God's word is not in effect. And so perhaps as I thought on this idea that and truth that the preaching of God's word is actually the greatest element of worship, perhaps even there's a convicting thing that uh, this, uh, um, this installment in our gospel worship series may be long overdue having even begun in areas like singing of God's praise and the sacraments, uh, that might confuse us and we might forget that the preaching of the word is actually the primary element of worship, which is our theme, that preaching is the primary element of gospel worship. And we'll consider that under two heads that are on your bulletin. The first is Uh, we consider the primacy of preaching in worship. And the second will be hearing preaching as an act of worship. So first, the primacy of preaching in worship. And so as we open our text, we find the Apostle Paul stress greatly the primacy of preaching. Of all the ordinances in the Christian church, preaching has the preeminence for him. Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, what preceded, obviously, as we read from verse 14 in the reading of the word, uh, Paul did baptize individuals and Paul did baptize households. But as far as what Christ primarily sent Paul and all ministers to do, it is to preach and especially to preach the gospel. Every other ordinance in worship in the church, even baptism, while it is very important does not have the importance that preaching does. 
And every other ordinance is actually subservient to preaching. And so it can be said of every minister that Christ did not send me to baptize or to administer the Lord's Supper, but to preach and preach the gospel. Because if, uh, if that is undone, then nothing else really matters. Right? Without the preaching of the word, really everything else becomes unintelligible in the worship of God. So preaching is primary, as it was for the apostle, but perhaps we should first ask before we run... Maybe we should walk and ask, what is preaching? Maybe uh, preaching is, like many things in the church, something we can identify. You can say, okay, pastor, you're preaching. But maybe you can identify it, but maybe you can't define it. And because of that, we very often accept things which are not preaching as preaching. There are a variety of words in the Greek New Testament that are translated as preach, and there's a few of those here in our text. But perhaps the word that gives us the most clarity on preaching is found underneath verse 23, when the apostle famously and memorably says, but we preach Christ crucified. The root word for preach in this verse is cariso. And that word conveys the activity of an official herald, a herald who proclaims a message on behalf of the king. And so a preacher who preaches, is a man who on behalf of King Jesus speaks as his official herald. A man sent by Christ, didn't Paul say, Christ sent me, not to baptize, but to preach. But certainly, Christ sent him to preach the gospel. And this man, by his office, is ordained to have the authority to say, Thus saith the Lord. We heard that weeks ago. Uh, such men in 1 Corinthians 4.1 are stewards of God's mysteries and are, according to 2 Corinthians 5.20, ambassadors of Christ himself. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. See, these are men who stand in Christ's stead, and you have to understand that rightly, given authority by Christ to only preach Christ. And they beseech you as ambassadors of Christ to be reconciled to God. And so in preaching, God speaks. Christ speaks. And he speaks to you through his ambassadors to be reconciled. And these men, not just for your salvation. You know, your salvation is the will of God, right? This is the will of God for you. Um, But that is not only the will of God for you. And so these men... They press on you the will of God for your life, all of it, right? Not only for salvation, but for all the counsel of God as God's herald. And so they press on your conscience God's word to you. And it is this pressing of the conscience that is most necessary in the preaching and pleading of the word. And as, we'll get to that in a bit, but as they preach with the authority of God, The message that they preach, where must it come from? It must come from God himself, right? The content of preaching comes out of the very word of God. Paul's exhortation to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2 was what? Preach the word. Preach the word. The content of the preacher's message of his authoritative proclamation must be the word of God. They're not preaching their opinions to you. They're not preaching even religious books. I have, we have a Calvin study, but I cannot preach Calvin to you, right? Uh, I don't preach dreams and visions that I had. I preach the word, the word of God. As all other forms of God's revelation have ceased, A man must open the word of God. He must take the Holy Scripture and he must preach that and that to you only. No matter, beloved, how foolish the message of the word seems to be to this age, right? No matter how countercultural it is, the man must be willing to preach, right? He is in truth an ambassador of Christ, but in truth in the world's eyes he must be seen as a jester, right? Proclaiming a message that is folly, Uh, That is what the world sees the message of the Bible 
uh, verses 20 through 22. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. You see, one of the reasons that the Christian ministry has been so totally defanged is because men are afraid that the message of the word of God is foolishness to the world. And yet the man who gets up to preach the word must preach faithfully that whatever comes out of the word of God is the very truth of God and it has the power of God behind it. And what the world wants to do is they want to dispute philosophy and psychology and every other ology. Others seek signs and wonders, as the text says, as both the papacy and the charismatics do. But what is it God has ordained? But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. And it is the foolishness of preaching that saves them that believe. And the problem is, right, Satan gets his hooks into the church and says, well, it's foolish to preach this message of Christ crucified, so why don't you just uh, find other ways to have them be saved and to know God? But we can't do that. The minister must preach Christ. He must preach the word. And so it seems like folly, right, to think that God's power is found in preaching. This is why also men don't preach outdoors, right? They're afraid of what the world is going to think about the message of Christ crucified, And so why be made a laughingstock? And yet the apostles were made the laughingstock of the world. And yet the world was converted and turned upside down. Because God promises that in the faithful preaching of Christ, his power is present. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Right? In other words, don't evaluate things the way the world evaluates things. When the world says how foolish a man is getting up there to preach the word, right? What they're trying to do is rob us of the power of God, right? In the preaching of the gospel, most of all, right? The preaching of the cross, Christ crucified for the sins of his people. The power of God is there. When Christ is preached up, when his death is, his burial, his resurrection and ascension is preached. When we preach that he will come again to judge the living and the dead, such that God now commands men everywhere to repent. What a foolish message this is, right? A man gets up to preach this in front of the world's uh, mightiest and smartest philosophers because this is, what, what, this is what the Apostle Paul did. He preached that God commands men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17.31, this is the power of God unto salvation, the preaching of this message. And you know the, uh, the response it received, right? When, when Paul preached at Mars Hill, what happened? And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked the foolishness of the cross. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Yet there is also this sense that there are others who might begin to believe. This is the foolishness of of preaching, friends. And this is the glory and the power of it. And as we think on our gospel worship series, right, this is what a high liturgy in worship that displaces the preached word will never have. This conflict with the sinner's conscience. This setting of Christ before them. Choose this day whom ye will serve, right? Right? Uh, You can be very comfortable. A sinner is very comfortable, right? Their conscience is assaged by kneeling and smells and bells and water and wine, but not the pressing of the claims and authority of King Jesus upon the souls in attendance, not by the preaching of the word that says, thou art the man, flee to Christ. This is why all kinds of sinners are very comfortable in liturgical churches. Oh, I need to kneel now. Oh, I need to offer this bit of incense. I need to do this. I need to do that. There is no pressing of the conscience to flee to Christ in the preaching of the word. And so for this reason, 
in Reformed churches and in apostolic churches, the preaching of the word was considered the greatest work of the ministry. It is the great converting ordinance of Christ. Through it, souls are saved. And what is the end of the saved soul? Worship and adoration of God. And so it must, by necessity, have the primary place in the worship of God. The Lord's Supper, it does not convert. Uh, If you think that, it leads to the evil of pedo communion. Baptism does not convert. If you think that, it leads to the evils of papacy, of the papacy and baptismal regeneration. Of every ordinance, it is the preaching of the cross that is the prime means of conversion. Romans 10.17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But what is that word? Is it even in Romans 10, the word read? No, it is the word preached. In verse 14 of Romans 10, And how shall they hear without a preacher? It is the preached word by which ordinarily faith comes by hearing. And because preaching of the cross especially is foolishness in the eyes of the world and natural man, here is the glory of it to you who believe, right? You will never attribute your conversion under the preaching of the word to a man's wisdom or intellect. That the man up here was just very reasonable and he argued you into the kingdom. Instead, to the natural man, to your flesh, the, the, the message is foolishness. A crucified Savior who died in my place, who was God and man in one, and this Savior was resurrected, and now he's at God's right hand where he will judge the living and the dead, and all who flee on to him, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You will not find anything like that in the world's philosophers who think they're so smart, and when you start to believe what they have to say, of course it was just their ingenuity and their way of, um, of seducing you by their words, but not through the foolishness of the cross. There is no uh, natural advantage to believing Christ and him crucified. And so God will get the glory who uses a foolish means to show his power. And so Paul says the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, you think about that in a sense, in a sense, right? What What is weaker than words on a page? Really, right? You know, unlike the Islamic horde, we're not here to convert you with the physical sword, right? It is the preaching of the sword of the Lord, the word of God. And yet, right, it is God's word that creates the universe. And it's God's word that makes dead men's souls come to life, right? The word of God, the weakness of God is stronger than men. God will use the foolish things to show his power. And a single word from God is stronger than the mightiest armies of the greatest nations. Paul also says, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And so as the word is preached, right, the world thinks these things that are preached are folly. Even this message here that preaching is the greatest ordinance of them all. That would be foolishness to men, right? As I've mentioned, so many men are taken by the eloquence of the world's wisdom. You know, they listen to something like Carl Sagan saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And they pat themselves on the back and they say, how marvelous, how wonderful, right? How brilliant the man is. And they're taken in by it. But we preach the foolishness of the gospel. We preach Christ crucified. And when Sagan and Dawkins are no more than minor footnotes in Wikipedia, Christ crucified will still be proclaimed and souls will be saved because God's power doesn't work through the folly of man's natural wisdom, but instead through the foolishness of the preaching of the cross. And that is how God's power is manifest to us. And as I've said, Because this message is foolishness in the eyes of the world, God's design is such that we can say it could only be God's power to convert us by the preaching of the word. Uh, The message is actually not, in fact, foolish, right? It is the wisdom and power of God. We're talking about how it is perceived by natural man. It is perceived as folly. Uh, 
to the mystery, uh, the mystery of godliness, right, to the natural man is folly. But when we are converted, right, we see this as the power of God, God and man uh, in a hypostatic union to save us and so on. But because this message is folly, God alone gets the glory. And when we're converted under preaching, we say only the power of God can account for my conversion, right? I was never, I was never tickled by intellectual arguments. Well, with that then, maybe we could ask, what makes preaching distinct from the reading of the word? This is a question I don't think that many of us ask. Why has God ordained the preaching of the word? In other words, why has God not just ordained readers of the word instead of preachers of the word? Why don't men just say, hear ye, hear ye, let me just read the word of God to you, close it, and then move on? And interestingly enough and astonishingly enough, why does he elevate the preaching of his word over the reading of it? These are profound questions, I think. Um, First, and I'm going to start, I, I thought about going the other way, but maybe I'll start here with a bit of a pastoral note. First, because in the wisdom of God, the Lord has appointed pastors who preach to tend to his flock, right? And they are to connect the word of God to their hearers, whatever their audience is, right? They are to know the people they preach to and know not only what word they need to preach to the flock, but also how to preach that word to their own congregation. They are to know how to particularly preach to you. You know, two chapters from now, uh, the apostle will demonstrate that in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able You see, this man knows the Corinthian church, and he knows by God's wisdom what they need. And that is Christ's wisdom in the ministry of the word in sending men to us, men called pastors, under shepherds, and their heralding of the gospel is to be in view of the the commandment in the Proverbs, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flock. They feed you on the word of God, and they bring the word of God in a way in which you can digest it, And in a way that you most necessarily need it. You know, these are also men that, as Hebrews 5 explains, can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Now, one of the glories of having a preacher of the word is that they are meant to be men whose spirits are provoked by the Holy Spirit, not only by the sins of God's people, but also... These are men who themselves have received the comfort of the Holy Ghost uh, for their own infirmities, for their own sins, right? And what they have received, they are charged to give to you. And this is why the preaching of the word is the greatest of the ordinances of God and why he uses men, not angels, so that men who are touched by God's grace will have compassion on those who have need of grace. You know, unconverted men ought never be ordained, of course, but the worst part of an unconverted minister is this. He does not know how to minister grace because he has never been touched by it. And yet, if you think on the greatest of preachers, I was thinking about men, you know, you think of men like Rutherford and and, um, Spurgeon and such, were these not men who are touched by the grace of God and they're able to preach grace to those who are far off and have need of it they're gripped with their own need of grace. And they, what they do is they bring the word of God in such a way that it can meet the people of God. It can meet them in their sins. It can meet them in their need for comfort and everything else that they need. They feed the people of God with spiritual food. They digest the word of God, so to speak. And this will lead to our second reason. They digest the word of God in such a way and they expound it in such a way that you, the people of God, can profit from it. And that's really the second reason that the Lord has exalted preaching because God's people need his word exposited and explained to them. This is part of the preaching of the word and why ministers are sometimes called teaching elders in distinction to the ruling elders. You know, think about your lives, people of God. And in a lot of ways, you're more blessed, uh, though we don't take advantage of it, than the generations that came before, right? You have access to the Word of God. You have access to commentaries. You have access to so much spiritual food. But six days, you are called to labor in your ordinary vocations. And it is under the preaching of the Word, especially on the Sabbath day, not just on the Sabbath day, that you get to hear the Word of life opened 
and expounded. Right? You come to the men who are set apart, the ministers of the word, and what is their labor six days of the week? In the word and doctrine, right? They labor in word and doctrine. They are to work as hard as you work in your ordinary vocations to take this word, digest it, and bring it to you, right? So that these men preach the meaning of the word of God to your people, to his people, so that you may rightly divide it yourself. Uh, Do you remember the Ethiopian eunuch's quandary? He had the word of God but he needed it expounded to him. And so who did God send? Philip, right? Acts 88, 30 through 31. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest, right? So here is the Ethiopian eunuch reading the word of God. And here's what the, the eunuch responded. How can I except some man should guide me? This is what the preaching of the word does, is it guides you through the word of God so that you might have fruition of it. Thomas Goodwin said that preaching in a more special manner reveals God's word. When an ointment box is once opened, then it casts its savor about. And when the juice of a medicinal herb is once strained out and applied, then it heals. And so it is the spiritual meaning of the word let into the heart which converts it and turns it to God. You see, the the minister opens and unlocks the word of God to you and applies it to you such that preaching actually in a very profound way amplifies the word of God and it illuminates it and it opens it to the hearer and it unlocks, as Goodwin says, the word's medicinal value so that we may receive it more fully. Hearing even the preaching of it and the opening of the word as thus saith the Lord. And this is why pastors are counted as gifts from Christ in Ephesians 4. And why Paul says that the ministers of God are yours and part of his God's treasury to you. For all things are yours. And then he lists ministers, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21 through 22. Right? They are, your, they are God's servants to you that you might better know God. Now, Not everything that is called preaching is preaching. And so the Apostle Paul, as we evaluate preaching, taught Timothy how to preach the word in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, but I want to focus on his next words. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And so in the preaching of the word, the uh, minister takes this word, right? He explains its doctrine. We just heard about that and teaches its meaning to his hearers as I'm explaining what these words of scripture mean. But the problem is in many reformed churches today, that is where the preaching ends. And in many ways, that is actually where the preaching begins, right? Preaching is not a a, a Bible study in understanding what the word has to say. I've, I've sat under so-called preaching where the minister just explains what the text means. But what has he neglected? He has neglected the reproving, the rebuking, and the exhortation of preaching. Consider what these ingredients of preaching are uh, and what they, why they are needed on top of a minister explaining the text. Paul says a minister must reprove the people of God. What is that? He convicts them of their sin. Second, he rebukes the people of God. What is that? To turn them from their sin. He takes the word and he applies the word. And this is the part that men are afraid to do. He presses it on the conscience of the hearers. Right? You know, it's, um, it's a strange thing to me anyway. When I read, you know, older sermons... Uh, and good sermons from today as I listen to them. And yet so many who come to our services say, well, that was just very convicting to be under the preached word as almost like they've never been convicted by the preached word before. But we ought to expect this, brethren. Uh, We need the pressing of God's word on the conscience, right? Uh, But let me just say this. uh, Pressing the word of God on the conscience is good, but still insufficient. Right? Some men will try to do this, but their sermon ends up being a scolding. 
right? It's just one scolding after another. Paul said this, Timothy, also exhort. Also exhort. And the word in the Greek language is the word used of the Holy Spirit when he is called the comforter. So in a real sense, Paul is telling Timothy, also comfort, comfort my people. And when the preacher convicts and rebukes, his work in preaching is not over until he also holds out comfort. And comfort found where? In platitudes, in tickling ears. No, the promise of the word that points us to Jesus Christ, right? That the Lord Jesus can and will heal us and forgive us when we repent. That all who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even the chief. That in Christ also, when you think of how foolish you have been, how unholy you have been, that in Christ all that you uh, lack is found. That our righteous standing with God is found in Christ. Our sanctification is in Christ. Our wisdom is in Christ. And our redemption is in Christ. Consider Paul's exhortation in verse 30, this comfort. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is the comfort that is preached, isn't it? This is the comfort of comforts. All that the sinner lacks when he is reproved and rebuked is found in Jesus. The remedy for all that we need is in Christ And so, Timothy, you are not just to reprove, you're not just to rebuke, you're also to exhort. Go to Christ. And the power of preaching is not found. And we can be, you know, God often uses men with powerful, mighty voices, with able rhetorical skills, but that is not the power of preaching, friends. The power of preaching is not in the preacher. And that's why we give glory to God alone for the preached word. It's a mighty ordinance because the minister who preaches is utterly dependent on the power of the Holy Ghost. In the next chapter in verses 4 through 5, a famous text, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, right? Unlike Carl Sagan and Richard Dawkins, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The Holy Ghost comes with power in the preaching of the word, so that you would say, my faith does not rest in the minister. It does not rest in his uh, intellect, in his rhetoric, but in the power of God. When there is a mighty word that comes from God through the preacher, it is never the preacher. It is of the Holy Ghost. The very same spirit that inspired the word that is preached. And that is why the best ministers, the most humble, right? They, they plead for the spirit's wisdom and power when they preach in their preparation. And even when they come to deliver their sermon. And what you must never do, beloved, is confuse the man's ministry for the spirit's ministry. Right? We often run afoul with saying, I love that minister and the way he preaches. Well, friends, that's how worms consume a man, right? When he is tempted to not give glory to God. The glory goes to the spirit who works through the preacher. We are to be thankful for faithful stewards, but the glory, it goes to God alone. Now, the other profound truth about preaching that must be embraced in worship is that the faithful preaching of the word is to be counted as the word of God, such that now, as so far as I am preaching faithfully, God is speaking to you in the sermon. This is God speaking. Uh, Reformed churches have long confessed this. The second Helvetic confession says it perhaps most plainly that the preaching of the word of God is the word of God. Our larger catechism is the same. Question 160 says, we must receive the preaching of the word as the word of God. Now that derives from texts like 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. When you uh, hear the word of God faithfully preached, the content of it is God's word to you. 
uh, in its reproofs, in its exhortations, in the minister's applications. Insofar as they comport with the truth of the word, the Holy Spirit is speaking. And we are not to refuse him that speaketh, as you heard last week from Hebrews 12. Um, I have used this um, commentary by John Owen before in the preached word here, but I think this is an excellent explanation, so I will say it again, on how the preached word is the word of God. In his commentary on Hebrews 4, he says, The word is like the sun in the firmament. Thereunto it is compared at large in Psalm 19. It hath virtually in it all spiritual light and heat, but the preaching of the word is as the motion and beams of the sun, which actually and effectually communicate that light and heat unto all creatures which are virtually in the sun itself. And so what preaching is, proper preaching, is a projection of the word of God in a way that touches the hearer, that touches the people of God. It brings the word down in a way that confronts their own souls and condescends to us, right? Such that we might read that all have come short uh, have come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? We see that as a propositional truth in the scripture. What does the preacher do? It says, you and I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He expounds that doctrine. He shows you how that is so. He goes through the commandments of God and says, you have blasphemed, you have lied, you have uh, stolen what is not yours, you have coveted, you have not kept the Sabbath day, on and on and on. And you find that the Lord himself speaks in that and takes a text where you might be uh, uh, in, in a mind tempted to not apply it to yourself and brings it to you. Right? The preaching of the word projects the word of God to you and presses it on the conscience. Now, that does mean that there is a level of discernment you're called to exercise. For not everything a man preaches it may be in accord with the word itself. You know, if I got up here and started to give my opinions on matters or taught strange, strange doctrines, you are not to receive my preaching as the word of God. Right? The Bereans taught you the way to go. Acts 17.11 commends them as these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Our larger catechism says we are to only admit the truth that is preached as the word of God. But when it does accord with the word, God has spoken and we must hear him speak. So is the preaching of the word the greatest of Christ's ordinances? Absolutely so. Brethren, no other ordinance Christ has given has this power or promise. And no matter how foolish an ordinance it seems to be, remember verse 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so in our second head, we consider how hearing preaching is an act of worship. Now with all that before us, we can better understand, and perhaps I don't have to apply this so rigorously, I think you better understand how preaching fits in worship. But let me just say that plainly. Preaching and attending to it is an element of worship. We worship God through attending to preaching. And that is a solemn, and that is a a reverent thing. And because of this lack of understanding in the ministry, first and foremost, ministers do not preach as they should. They make their sermons light and humorous affairs, don't they? You know, it's one series of jokes, one after another. Or they make their, and maybe in the Reformed world, they make their sermons into lectures for the seminary hall. They'll give you 300 bullet points on how a particular doctrine is understood throughout church history and what Turretin has to say on this and so on and so forth. But what that does not do is it doesn't seek to draw out of the hearer the heart of a worshiper. Right? A worshiper needs to have, right? where does worship begin for a fallen creature? Needs to have their pride humbled before the Almighty. And they must bring themselves to give glory to God and bow their heart to him. I'll likely have another sermon on how to attend to the preaching of the word. And so for tonight, I simply want to reveal the truth that we worship God when we attend to preaching in faith and in reverence. And it is worth knowing that the preaching of the word did not begin in the Christian church as an element of worship, but it actually began uh, at the very least. Well, you see that the prophets, right, they would preach, thus saith the Lord, causing men to turn to the Lord. 
and worship. But you see it very clearly in the Jewish synagogue that the word was not only read, but it was preached. Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So Moses, meaning the Torah, was not only read but preached when they worshipped in the synagogues. And that was certainly preparatory for Christian churches that have superseded the synagogue. Now you might ask, and I think you're getting a sense of the question being answered in your own soul, why is preaching the central and preeminent element of worship? And I think you need to think on it this way, especially in our society that hates such things. It is the ultimate assertion of God's sovereignty, right? It is not a dialogue. It is not anything but God speaking to you and you having to sit there and listen. It is an assertion of the king's crown rights. In preaching, the Lord says to you this, be still and know that I am God. You will listen and I, the Lord thy God, will speak. We see that the king has a message for us. And what do we do as worshipers? We humble ourselves before him to receive that message. Under preaching, friends, and this is why man hates it naturally, there is no disputing with God. There is no bargaining with God. We are like Habakkuk under the preaching and say, I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Right? The preaching of the word is not you talking back to the preacher, which would be to talk back to God, right? You instead are to sit and to listen, and I am too when I am under the preaching of the word. This is the stuff of worship. While we learn of God in the preaching of the word, what we learn of him is meant to humble ourselves, right? We learn that he is utterly glorious and holy, and we are not. We hear the word preached to us that says, Holy, holy, uh, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Right? We join Isaiah in saying, Woe unto me, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among an unclean people. And we join with the 24 elders in Revelation, and fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, this is what the preaching of the word is meant to produce in us, a sense of awe and reverence for God. And without the preaching of the word, we really would not worship the true and living God of a truth. In Isaiah 66, when the Lord speaks from his throne in heaven, he says, But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and what? Trembleth. At my word. That's the heart of a worshiper, and that's meant to be the heart of the preaching of the word. Those that are conscionable hearers of the word, those who listen intently and will receive by faith, reprove, rebuke, and comfort out of the word of God, right? These are true worshipers. And it's on these, isn't that a blessing? On these that the Lord looks upon. He looks on you who tremble at his word. And so proper preaching, friends, causes us to be humbled before the Lord. He really strips us bare, right? He strips us of our own wisdom, verses 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Where is he in view of Christ preached? Right? Once we walked, you know, if you remember your conversion, we walked as the worldly wise. We had our own sayings. We thought that this is true and that is true. We had our own philosophy about being good and how the world ought to be and what the world is and what really matters in life. But he strips that all bare in the preaching of the word and our own wisdom is taken away and we worship God. He strips us of our own righteousness. And he shows us that we are evil in our heart. In 1 Corinthians 14, 25, when there is prophesying, which is preaching, the secrets of a man's heart are made manifest. And so falling down on his face, what does he do next? He will worship God. Do you see how the preaching of the word draws us to our knees to worship God? In preaching, 
proper preaching. Anyhow, he strips us of any sense of our own glory or righteousness. What does verse 29 say in our text? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Right? This is what the proper preaching of the word is meant to do. It's to cause you and me both to be driven out of ourselves. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Why? That we might run to Jesus Christ for all our sufficiency, right? That we would see ourselves intellectually bankrupt, morally broke, and that we, as he holds out the Savior in the preaching of the word, would take Christ. Verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I've asked it once. I'll ask it again. When the mind that is touched by faith and the heart that is touched by faith hears that, does it not worship? Does it not worship because Christ is made our all in all? That we have nothing, we are nothing, but Christ has given us, uh, God has given us Christ who is everything. That we would find him our all in all. To what end then in verse 31? That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Is this not the stuff of worship? Is literally doxology, isn't it? Let him that glory, let him give praise, and let him glory in the Lord. That's the aim of preaching. And that is how preaching is meant to be an element of worship. That you would leave the preached word glorying in Christ. That your pride would be humbled, and you'd have nothing in yourself to glory in but that you would exalt the grace of God in Jesus Christ and you would be conformed to his will for you. And preaching and our attendance to it will magnify every other element of worship, right? It gives a spiritual sense to the sacraments. It becomes the fuel of our praise. It becomes the foundation of our prayers. It gives us worshipful hearts as there our hearts are, are, are pricked and we see the glory of Christ. It's the engine of our sanctification, and it will be the sledgehammer against our own wisdom and our sinful flesh. The Lord asks, is my word not like as a fire and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces in Jeremiah 23? It is. And the proper preaching of the word does exactly that. It burns up the dross in our hearts and it crushes the stony hearts that are within us. It causes us to cast ourselves entirely upon Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus such that a hallelujah bursts from our hearts when we worship God after preaching. We say, I am a great sinner, but oh, what a great Savior God has given me. And that kind of preaching produces the doxology and praise of worship, so that he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And so without proper preaching like that, friends, I'll return to this as this is a, a series on gospel worship. You may follow some kind of high liturgy you might have your smells and your bells, but friends, you will never really worship. Uh, even discounting the fact that God has never asked for these things and it's strange fire to him, especially in the New Testament dispensation. You will never worship God of a truth if the preaching of the word does not drive you out of yourself and to the Lord that you would only glory in him. And that is why preaching is central to worship that you would be driven, and me too, out of our sin and out of our folly and to Jesus. The worshiper of God comes to worship eager, saying, I will hear what the Lord our God has to say. Psalm 85, 8. But one is proven a true worshiper when they take the entirety of that verse. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people. Praise God and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. One is proven a worshiper when they submit themselves to God's will, when they are doers of the word and not hearers only, right? Uh, this is how you know that you have really worshiped God in the preaching of it. When afterward, it bears fruit in your life. How can I say I have worshiped God? I have heard the word. I have been chastised by it. I have fled to Christ for comfort or I have found comfort in Christ, but I won't do what the word has to say. 
Do I truly worship God? This is why this is, again, the greatest means the Lord uses in the worship of God. But you are to take the word of God you hear and hide it in your heart. Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. Oh, beloved, you know, the sad truth is many are entertained by preaching. You know, preaching has become a kind of performance art. Uh, I even know people who go and want to listen to good, sound ministers who are very convicting, but they are never turned by the message preached. They really are, are amused in a, in a kind of perverse kind of way. I like preaching. There are many people who like preaching like there are those who like bird watching. But friends, you are proven to be a, a, a true worshiper of God under preaching when the word of God changes your life. You hear by faith and respond to it and you bring the fruit of it in your life by God's help. And we need a revival of this kind of preaching and a revival of this kind of hearing in the church. Preaching that confronts us with the holiness of God and the reality of Christ crucified. Men who would say, but we preach Christ crucified. This is what we need for revival. Well, here at the end of our time together, I suppose with all this preaching, it must be asked, with all this doctrine of Christ crucified, have you yourself believed on the risen Savior? Have you yourself turned from your sin, purposed to turn from your sin, and to the Savior who holds himself out? Have you been driven out of yourself by the Holy Ghost who sees the secrets of your heart And have you been wounded by it? And have you taken Christ crucified for yourself? Beloved, friend, take Christ yourself, repent of your sin, and choose life. This is the message that is the power of God unto salvation, that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a promise that is. What a profound thing it is that you have heard that. You are to believe it and be saved. Well, I trust that you have now seen why preaching is the central element of our worship services here. And I pray that the Lord, our God, would give us a greater esteem for this ordinance and that he would raise up a generation who hunger and thirst for proper preaching and he would raise up men who will be bold enough to be counted a fool to say, thus saith the Lord in the face of a very difficult generation that will press the claims of King Jesus upon the consciences of their hearers, that they would flee to Christ for refuge, away from their wisdom, away from their own righteousness, away to Christ, that the world would be saved and turn to Jesus and worship God. Amen. Let us arise and attend to prayer now. O Lord, our God, Uh, We are often so easily amused. And yet, Father, we need to be confronted by the word of God. Would you confront us by the word preached? May you cause us even this day to esteem the preaching of the word, that you would cause your servants, even myself, to preach faithfully, not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power that the folly uh, of the message to natural man would be preached boldly and that we who hear would flee to refuge, for refuge to Jesus Christ. That where we are, where we are uh, not converted, we would be converted. Where we need faith, Lord, we would flee to him for faith, saying, Lord, we believe, help thou our unbelief. Where we need sanctification, he would give us holiness. And where we need to know that our redemption is entirely of the Lord, we would look unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. O Lord our God, would you bless this preaching of the word, that we would esteem it, and that we would not esteem the man, but the God who works through it. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.